This conference will now be recorded. All right, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that we, we are ready with the collection of the basic information about the different types of interface. Uh, if everybody is okay, we're going to move back to the Tuesday time meeting that we used to meet to accommodate more people to attend. But meanwhile, I'm going to basically circulate the a kind of user guide how we should actually fill the Excel sheet and a blank Excel sheet to different people. Then they can actually fill out and send it back to me to basically put it on the comparison table. But if people prefer different time, they can tell me right now. We can decide on that. Just to refresh everyone's memory, this is the die to die uh, comparison spreadsheet that uh, the OCP, the ODSA releases every couple of years. And this year, Shahab's gonna have done a really nice job trying to drive it um, for the 2023 release. So if you want your fire on it, please reach out to him. Thank you, Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, John, it's all yours. Our speaker right. today is John Parker um, Cadence. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Bobby. Um, this, uh, Bobby and I were at a kind of the, the way this all got started. Well, Bobby and I were at a conference, and Bobby probably remembers. I don't know whether it's EP EPS or whether it was uh, the IEEE. There, it, there were a lot of conferences this uh, year for packaging, but Bobby and I met there, and he asked that I uh, kind of redo that presentation that I delivered at that conference. Um, for this group, and I know there's a lot of experts in this group, so some of this might be uh, basic. Um, some you might get a little something out of it, uh, but it's really a, a perspective on this whole world of 3D HI or 3D heterogeneous integration, coming from a packaging guy uh, that works for an EDA company. So yeah, the, the presentation isn't going to talk about products. The presentation is going to just talk about kind of really what's happening, what, you know, our perspective of the, the transition from monolithic to modularized devices, uh, and then some of the challenges we see from working with different uh, partners and customers related to the tool set for designing and, and analyzing and, and verifying these types of designs. So that's the title, basically, when chips turn into systems, that's kind of the, kind of the summary right there, we, we kind of see this world becoming, you know, moving from a monolithic approach to more of a system approach. So first couple slides really are here to, I think most people understand why this phenomena is happening, that we're moving to these, um, this world of 3DHI, but I wanted to give our, or my perspective of why that's happening. Um, Cadence has been involved with the world of chiplets since what I consider to be sort of close to the beginning, which was the DARPA chips program that Dan Green ran, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, So we've been in this world for a while, so this is, again, our perspective. So why people are doing this, uh, cost and yield are pretty much tied together. Design big chips, the yield goes down, the cost goes up. Even designing smaller chips at advanced nodes requires millions and millions of dollars and huge design teams of experts, hundreds of verification engineers that are they're hard to hard to find and expensive to pay. So um, if you're designing a, a medium volume product or a low volume product, it's almost impossible to recoup the NRE at a, you know, something below a 10 nanometer node. So uh, those types of companies that you see in aerospace and defense, for example, have already uh, made this pivot to the, these modularized, uh, basically the world of 3DHI. Other things driving it is max the maximum size of what we can build, 856 millimeter squared, is the biggest size die we can actually build based on the replica equipment in the uh, boundaries. And people are trying to put more and more stuff, more functionality on these devices. So they're running out of space uh, within that can actually be mon uh, manufactured in a, in a, on a monolithic chip. So it's another factor driving this. Uh, of course, analog RF. Uh, I.O. and memory don't, don't uh, scale like traditional digital logic, with just following Moore's law. So they've always, it doesn't always make sense to go chase the latest node for those types of technologies. And of course, we see 
more mixed signal designs, more I.O. on these designs, and so it becomes pretty obvious those are areas that need to be looked at as far as taking off the chip and into the form of chiplet. And one of probably the most surprising thing we found is we, we actually are working with a couple companies that are moving to 3D because of form factor. They don't, they're putting something in a wearable, uh, you know, an eye, your eyeglasses frame, and they don't have enough room in a certain X, Y direction, so they start to go in the Z direction. That's that's not a typical example, but that's kind of the, um, you know, one of the corner cases of why people are going to 3DHI. So that said, um, this is our view of what this means. Again, coming from a package designer, this this move to these chipless based architectures and what we call heterogeneous integration today. So we're going to start on the left hand side. Oh, and let me bring up my laser pointer here if I can. And so on the left-hand side here, we have the, the old world of multi-chip modules, multi-chip packages, system and packages. We had lots of names for it, but really those were built as the, to reduce what we call swap, size, weight, and power of the board. So we took the bare die out of those uh, system level, board level uh, designs, and we, entered, we put those bare die on laminate or ceramic packages mounted with wire bond attached or flip chip attached. And um, we're able to reduce power, reduce size, reduce weight, do, get get those things accomplished using the uh, you know the bare die instead of package die on some sort of packaging uh, technology. So that absolutely was heterogeneous integration. We, we didn't care whether the die were different process nodes or different technologies, mixing GAN, GAF, CMOS, everything together. Um, we, we just didn't call it heterogeneous integration, but we've been doing in the packaging space for, I've been doing this for 40 years and it's been going on a long longer than I've been here. So there has been heterogeneous integration done. It was just done from the system, basically the re reduction of a system PCB to a smaller form factor driven by swap. So that's the old world that continues. That, by the way, does not go away. Uh, but what the new exciting part of what's happening is the right hand side of this picture, and that is the designers of, of ASICs and, and system on a chips, based on the previous slide, you know, cost and, and form factor and other things, are leaving that world of monolithic chips and going to these chiplet based architectures, which really means taking different parts of the chip, different blocks of IP, IO, whatever it happens to be building that on a whatever process makes the most sense and then re-aggregating that disaggregated monolithic chip into some sort of packaging technology including stacking but mostly today side-by-side -side placement so that's where we use the term today heterogeneous integration because these chiplets you know your io can be a 28 nanometer your memory at 10 nanometer and your accelerator and GPU at five nanometer and that's where the term comes in today but for packaging designers um, again we've kind of been working in that world of, of heterogeneous integration for quite some time so that's our view of heterogeneous integration which is really the what we use to to define uh, this disaggregated SOC approach um, that we're all that a lot of companies are moving to because of costs and, and other factors. So that's our take. So you know, I think from a package designer's perspective, it's the most exciting time in the industry uh, right now because we we have all this activity coming from you know the traditional monolithic chip designers, and we still have the people trying to reduce the size and and weight of PCB. So there's been huge growth in the packaging uh, field over the last couple of years, which is great. So the next just slide a, here. Just, just a quick yep. question on the last slide. Yep. yep. Um, sure. So uh, obviously going into a package, my experience, in, my experience with multi-chip module and bare die and packaged multi-chip modules is it's an extremely expensive game and all the qualification is, is huge. Do you actually yep. see, um, do you actually see the package world com becoming like the PCB world is today? You know, big, big, big companies making uh, very small margins and putting these packages together like they put the PCBs together. So 
an industry, we can make an industry out of this for tier one, tier two, and tier three players. And it's not just uh, for the um, for the tier ones. Yeah, so if you hold that question, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about exactly that, where, you know, so in fact, starting in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about how we see okay. Sorry. packages playing a role here, if you hold that, give me a couple slides here. So. Great so question. I have a question, um, John, uh, on the previous yeah. slide. Can I ask a very quick question uh, on yeah. the previous slide? Uh, uh, I asked in the chat as well. Uh, the use case on the PCB as a, uh, compared to SOC is a very distinct, different use case. Uh, do you expect yeah. same approaches to both? Uh, or how do you expect these two, uh, although they require market chip, how do you expect uh, left side to differ from right side? What are the key distinctions? Right, that cannot that's be great question, uh, and I yeah, great question. My slides will get to that. That's what we're going to be talking about. Okay, thanks. So if you hold your question. I promise I will cover that. That's one of the main points of this presentation. All right. Okay. So let's get, let's move forward here. So our our view of this term heterogeneous integration isn't. It doesn't mean packaging. Heterogeneous integration is just a, a way to build a modularized system instead of a, mono, uh, a monolithic system. How you then build that system or aggregate those chiplets is, of course, in the world of packaging. And th these types of packages, we're going to talk a lot more about this. We'll get to everyone's uh, questions. Uh, there are very good questions that you know that have to do with the different type of packaging here, but. You know, we see a lot, of course, uh, integration of chiplets on silicon interposers. Um, we see chiplet integration with interconnect bridges. We're starting to see it with um, e even high-density fan-out wafer-level packages with high-density RDL. Uh, the kind of the state of the art is more on the right-hand side here that not necessarily involves chiplets. So silicon stacking, we wouldn't consider that a chiplet world. So we'll talk about what makes that different than the, the world of chiplets. Um, we see people stacking entire wafers, you know, a, a wafer of, of DRAM on uh, some processing logic, for example, and of course, a big push now for more photonics and more uh, uh, optics uh, at the edge of the packages and even into the packages. So we have, um, so the, the point of this slide is heterogeneous green integration. Okay, that just tells me your you're not going to build a monolithic device. You're going to build something out of chiplets. The next step is, okay, how are you going to aggregate or integrate all those chiplets together in what type of packaging? And, um, you know, they're, they're, I'm just listing some of the big the play, big players here also. There are other different types of packages that I don't have mentioned here that, that people are starting to use. So this presentation is going to talk about the different nuances of these different packaging technologies that integrate these together that will hopefully answer uh, some of these questions. So again, heterogeneous integration means I'm taking my big monolithic chip. I'm not doing monolithic anymore. I'm doing multiple chiplets uh, and I need to integrate those together in some sort of packaging. So now let's talk about the nuances of those different types of packages that, that people are starting to use to integrate these chiplets together. So on the left-hand side here, um, we see the traditional laminate types of packaging uh, technologies that for ball grid array design, land grid array design that have been uh, when Motorola came out with the ball grid array in 89 or 90, so the, for 30 years now, a little over 30 years, those types of tools that we have in place for traditional laminate style packaging, they've been extended to do things three-dimensionally, like a package on package as an example. Uh, we, we stack wire bond design, see a lot of that in, in memory. Now moving, of course, to microbump, we have these, these uh, embedded and, and elevated bridges. So the world of packaging has been, uh, and we'll talk about the, the tool flows, but it's been extended to understand some of the things we need for some of the 3D, you know, certainly things like microbump snap, uh, stacking and, and interconnect bridges. Um, and so these flows are have been slightly modified but, you know, basically take these designs out all day long. There's there's no real huge bottlenecks or, or challenges in this left-hand side of 3D packaging. If we move to the middle here where we move into silicon interposers and ultra high density uh, RDL, something like a uh, TSMC Info, for example, um, we start to blur the line between what we do on the left-hand side here. So there's a lot of the routing styles 
all angle route, routes and trace fillets and things like that are very similar to what we do on the left-hand side of the picture here in laminate. However, these designs are being built in a foundry. They're built, being built in a, in, a, in a wafer fab. And so there needs to be a very formal sign-off of LDS and DRC. The metal fill is more precise. So what we start to see in these applications in the middle is the combination of the tools you need on the left for routing styles and how you implement power structures with the tools you need on the IC side, things like uh, physical verification tools uh, are an, an example of that. So we start, that's why we call this these hybrid flows. They have a combination of tools from traditional system designers combined with uh, design tools and verification tools we see from uh, IC design worlds. So these are very, often very complex flows because you're basically bringing the, the two worlds together of system design and IC design. Then we move to the far right here. This is kind of the cutting, in my mind, the cutting edge, and that's silicon stacking. Um, used to be people just used this term 3DIC, which just got overused, and now it doesn't really uh, mean too much as kind of a generic thing. But we, what I'm talking about here is silicon stacking, where you're using some sort of hybrid bond, uh, copper to copper, direct bonding. There's lots of different names for it, but uh, using very small, little, um, low temperature annealed connections to create a third dimension for designing integrated circuits, essentially. So people start to stack uh, macros on top of each other. We see people actually starting to fold things. Uh, probably the most common application today is things like L3 cache stacking uh, on top of the processing logic. So that's where um, where we kind of leave the world that we've used on the, on the left-hand side where we work in kind of the abstract view of what the chip or chiplet would look like to the world where we need to understand how to implement with multiple tech labs, multiple PDKs in a single layout session, representing the design detail down to the standard cell level, even down to the transistor level. So it's a different expertise, set of expertise, and certainly a different set of tools. You know, in this world, for example, you need STA. Over here, you don't use STA, and we'll explain that, I'll explain that coming up in the upcoming slide. So this this, this slide really um, uh, kind of talks about that that world of system design versus chip design using one kind of real life example. So what we would do in those 3D packaging and hybrid flows and as far as integrating chiplets is typically um, something what, that I'm showing here. So you would design your chiplet, the core logic shown here, and there would be a wrapper around that chiplet of micro buffers. So we're not using full buffers like you'd see on a die because we're not driving out some huge capacitive load out through packaging onto PCB. This is just for chiplet to chiplet. And then we have a fine, we have an interface that, that works off of BOW, UCIE, AIB, whatever it might happen to be, but we're not closing timing. We're validating the compliance of AIB, for example, through that interface. So we're basically modeling something just like we do on the system world, basically a transmit and receive through some parasitic channel. Okay, so that's, that's we've been doing this again for 25, oh, no, over 30 years. It's called signal integrity. We're, we're just validating that we're, the, we're compliant to the spec. There's not too much jitter. There's not too much noise uh, on the signal that connects the two different chiplets, uh, it, it, both either whether they're stacked or whether they're side by side as shown here. It's also the world where we work with these abstracts where everything's just treated as a black box. We're just doing, using some sort of IBIS representation, something like that, and modeling the switching behavior between these devices. But again, based on some standard that I think everyone in this group is, is familiar with. That is very different than the world of silicon stacking, where again, where we're stacking cache on top of processing logic, logic is the most common example today, but when we are in this world of silicon stacking, we use these solder-free connections, these hybrid bonds or copper to copper connects. Uh, this is where we need that full representation of each of the dyes. We can't treat these as abstracts in this world. It's today, in most cases, outside the world of CMOS image sensors, it's a, typically a single RTL, so it's a single representation of the system. It just gets partitioned now in a third dimension. 
and then the connection up through the different devices is just some parasitic, small little parasitic hybrid bond that gets inserted uh, between the devices. So in the world of silicon stacking, we still need to do things like FTA, and closing on flop-to-flop timing during the, in a synchronous design, for example. So that's a little nuance that uh, is, you know, that comes into play when you start talking about building things out of chiplets and building things in a, in the third dimension. So there's lots of other nuance, nuances. It takes it you know, would take half a day to go through everything, but that's an example of kind of how we differentiate between packaging tools and expertise and IC design tools and expertise. So what does this all mean for, my, for a tool, EDA tool provider? Uh, it really means this picture here, which is the need of the chip designers are converging with the needs and flows of the system designers. So pre-2010, so the, the big FPGA company partitioned their big FPGA on the silicon interposer in 2011. Is when all of this started to change. The foundries entered the world of packaging. Before that, it was just OSAS, it's outsourced some semiconductor assembly and test houses uh, that did this type of design. But that doesn't go away. OSAS still play a big role here. We just now are joined by the, the foundries and their back end or packaging offerings. But what it means from a, putting together a design flow um, for a lot of these types of designs, especially something like silicon interposers, like the picture shown in the middle there, it's that you start to need expertise and design tools from both sides of the, the spectrum, from the system design world for things like signal integrity to validate chiplet to chiplet compliance. You know, if it, even if it's a, a being laid out you know, over here in a high density RDL span away for a little packet, you need to go through verification steps on, on the die side. So that's why I think a lot of people that are that have already started doing this are starting to recognize that there's these flows are quite complex because you're now really combining two different, you know, what used to be two separate domains into one uh, design methodology. So that's kind of our view on some of the nuances between, you know, the different types of packaging, the different types of expertise. I now want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see uh, from an ecosystem perspective and then from a, a tool uh, uh, perspective on the next couple slides. So when I start off talking about um, probably, I would say in, in 2022 became one of the biggest topics at all the conferences I've been to anyway, especially in you attend any of the U.S. government uh, conferences, things like the SHIP program, things like that. Uh, this term header uh, uh, assembly design kits has, has really emerged as a must-have for uh, these 3DHI systems. And what assembly design kits are basically very similar to a PDK or process design kit that we've used in the world of IC design for the last couple of decades. When I design a chip today and I go to a the foundry, they provide me with this PDK that gives me the technology information, the, the material properties, gives me libraries of IOs standard cells, gives me sign-off decks for DRC, LBS, and metal fill, basically gives me the material, the data I need as a chip designer to have the confidence that what I'm designing in my CAD tool can actually be manufactured. We don't have that in advanced packaging. That's the pa packaging's kind of been the wild west, and, you know, there's a lot of um, iteration between design teams at a semiconductor company and the OSAT. Uh, where to the fact that OSAP have huge design centers now so that they can help iterate on that design because there is no formal um, kit or formal set of data that they provide that, that would be equivalent to a PDK that you do on the, on the chip side of things. So there's a big push there. Um, Cadence is, has, is, I can't mention any, any company names yet, but Cadence is doing a lot of work in this area to a lot of, with a lot of our partners on the OSAP and Foundry side to, to provide this assembly design kit uh, that would really be, um, you know, very, very helpful uh, to the, the people moving to the world of 3DHI. And of course, the, the big key difference between the PDK and the ADK is the A for assembly. And so, you know, making sure that when you're building the chiplet stack or you're placing chiplets side by side, that you're not violating some rule of the pick and place machine and you can actually assemble these designs. So 
80 Ks as a whole, that's an, that's an hour presentation within itself, but that's, that's one of the gaps that we see. Uh, next one is, of course, uh, consumer off the shelf for uh, uh, chiplets, or basically a, a storefront for chiplets where you can, uh, just like we do in the board world today, I can open an Arrow catalog or DigiKey catalog. I can grab 20, order 20 parts from there, 20 unique parts, add my special sauce to it, you know, add an FPGA or add some special ASIC, and I have a very unique product on the board side that I can create. That is absolutely the vision Dan Green had for the Drop the Chips program is to have this chiplet marketplace where, just like a board world, I could go off and order all these different chiplets. We're, we're a long ways away from that being reality. Most chiplet-based designs are done internally in these big vertically integrated companies. They design chiplets that they use in their 3D HI product, and they don't necessarily ch share that chiplet with their competitors or with anybody else. We're, we're making a lot of progress thanks to this group uh, through standards uh, with the CDX standard and with the BOW standard. So we, we've made a lot of progress um, thanks to a lot of people on this call in the area of standards, but there's still kind of a business case for the IP companies, which is also an IP provider to, to make that transition to providing basically known good chiplets um, that work off you know, UCI or BOW or whatever it might happen to be. So we're closer. We're certainly closer now than we were a couple of years ago to having more chiplets available, but we're we're not at the point where you can open a catalog and start going through and then and adding, you know, picking dozens of different chiplets. So there's momentum there. I think we're going to get there in the next couple of years, but that's still a gap in what I in, my, in, in these types of uh, products that we're designing. Next is on the kind of the design challenges and of course cadences area of expertise is on the design flows and the tools that are provided there. Uh, you know, I don't want to scare anybody, but yet hopefully you can appreciate that now we, we have all these extra tools that potentially come to the design flow as we merge the world of IC design with system design. And so the expertise of every engineer needs to be uh, you know, expanded. Um, the, um, the tools today need to have better levels of integration and not only integration between system and PCB, but between digital and RF, uh, between the, the implementation tools and the sign off tools for electrical signal integrity and thermal and all those types of things. Um, and so it's an area that Cadence is just focused on is just creating a, a more uh, cohesive flow uh, between the different uh, design tools. But uh, most importantly, uh, if you're mo designing monolithic chips and you're world entering this world of 3 dhi the very first thing that, would you, that you need to consider in your design flow is a tool to aggregate all those chiplets, bring in the packaging, and, and come up with the top-level net list that's going to define how the chiplets are connected all the way through the packaging, which becomes very key to signing off on LBS, system LBS at the end of the day. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but so lots of complexity in design flows, some work being done there, but today a lot of it, all the designs that have been taped out require a lot of expertise and uh, a lot of scripting. And uh, we're, we're moving away from that as we start to create tighter levels of integration. On the analysis side, um, lots of challenges there. I mentioned system LBS, so this is, for a lot of people, they get halfway through their design and they're, they figure out, they start thinking about how they're going to LBS at the system level. So making their, sure, kind of like the picture shown here that everything's aligned and everything's connected uh, through the system. So um, unfortunately, system LBS, if you think about it halfway through your design cycle, it's a little bit too late. You need to think about that when you start your design so that you have that golden source list, uh, golden net list uh, source to, to drive it. Um, the other challenge of system LBS is oftentimes on cutting edge types of package technology, there may not be a rule deck yet. There might not be an LBS deck, and there certainly will for the chiplets, but the actual system level, it's not as common to have uh, a rule deck for that. So the system LBS methodology that you need to put into place need to work in a rule deck free environment and basically drive the system LBS without the need of the, of the rule deck. If you have one, great, but if you don't, you still need to be able to perform system LBS on your design. Um, other areas, I'm not going to go through all these, uh, but 
CMP play in areas in a face-to-face uh, um, direct bonding environment become critical. You have to have really advanced tools for the chemical mechanical polishing uh, effects on the, the, the face-to-face attachments. Um, early stage analysis is key in these types of design flows. So especially 3D, I start building a 3D system of chiplets. Um, I don't want to wait until I've done all the detailed place and route of everything to find out that thermally the, the thing's going to catch on fire. I need to know that very early on. And so Cadence has done some work here to, to allow the user to enter parametric data on the you know, expected hotspots and the estimated size of the package and the board that are going to be used to dissipate some of the heat and, and those types of things. Um, and then last but not least, you know, we're, we're building very large things now. We're beyond that 856 millimeter squared into, you know, 2X and beyond reticle sizes. So we have very large structures now that need to be solved and meshed to run a lot of the the analysis, uh, especially things like power analysis across a, a very large interposer becomes a challenge for a lot of uh, design tools. So you need to consider design tools that are even modern, to, you know, and are multi-threaded, massively parallelized sort of engines so they can distribute the job through multiple corners in the cloud and that type of thing. So those are some challenges on that real full, helpful full, full level flow for implementation analysis. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit on the details of advanced packaging for 3D implementation that might answer some questions that were asked earlier. So 3D implementation, I talked about this. Hey, John, real quick. Yep. What about reliability concerns? Is that starting to ease or when you just putting all these? No, that's a great question. Yeah, I think reliability is, you know, it's so those that have been around long enough know what really hurt the MCM market was known good die, right? You put together five different die across you know, coming from five different wafers, you're, you know, likely one of those is going to be bad, and, and that, that really kind of hurt the MCM market. I think, you know, that we have that same potential here, um, you know, where the more chiplets you add, um, you know, basically it's, it's more I.O., right? It's, it's not a monolithic thing anymore. You have all these interfaces, you know, solder-based and not solder-based across three dimensions and two dimensions, so it, it's a great point. It's it's something that um, I think is still being worked through um, by by a lot of companies now. I don't have any details on it. It's been a little bit, um, I don't spend a lot of time on that, but it's definitely a concern. It's okay, concern. thanks, just curious, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so on the implementation side, uh, we talked about this. You can't work in the, the black box abstract mode anymore. When you do this, you have to have an IC tool IC layout tool that understands how to work with multiple tech lefts or multiple PDKs. Hey, John. Yep. Sorry, this is Bapi. One one question. Do you, you know, in all these, uh, this actually goes back a couple of slides. Going back to your very first slide, which is about use, use cases, do you see use cases sort of segregating by packaging technology? Do you see system integration on the left segregating to one set of packaging technologies and die disaggregation settling to another? Um, sure, initially, right? So, you know, the left-hand side of this picture, you know, is we use laminate BGAs. That's, that was the standard for that. When we first went into the world of chiplets, everything was a silicon interposer, right? So there, there is a, so when we look at, you know, this picture here, the MCM world was done over here. The, the chiplet world was kind of done between, I would say, between embedded bridges and, and silicon interposers is how it started. But, you know, we see a lot of, um, a lot of that changing, you know, chiplets today are, to me, a chiplet, it, you know, it, it's got to be something at a, you know, 50 micron sort of pitch. Otherwise, it's more like a die. It's at a 120 micron pitch. So, you know, that that dictates the type of packaging you need to use, right? So chiplets today, would, if you're in that 50 micron range, you need to be on something that can handle that sort of pin density. So that would typically be some sort of silicon or wafer level process like a silicon interposer, like a silicon bridge, um, but that's changing. You know, we're now um, seeing these RDL interposers come out and they, they can't go down to the same geometries as a silicon interposer, but they can get a lot closer than the old uh, laminate technologies. And we can get down to, you know, eight or nine micron sort of line in space and, and get down to much finer 
a pin fetches. So it, it's, it's the world of packaging. It's always evolving. It's, we don't just get a new node every two years and adjust our tools and flow through that. We, we might get five new packaging technologies in a year. So that, and, you know, people will are quick to migrate, usually based on cost. If I can design get my same performance, my same bandwidth, everything I want out of my product, but I can do it at 30% less money, you know, most people are, are going to take that up. So that's why I think you see a lot of, uh, I, I've seen personally a lot of people starting to move away or use less silicon interposers and move to more RDL interposers, as an example, because the RDL interposer doesn't have a TSB, meaning the cost is going to be less than those types of things. So I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yet, I mean, I think eventually, you know, I think these worlds, will, as we get more higher density thin film laminates um, that start to rival what we see in silicon, you know, we we might come up with a standard package, but you know that's the problem. But right? that's but Dan Green's vision of having one chiplet to chiplet interface, which of course out of that out of DARPA chips came AIB, but yeah, that's where Intel made it license free. But that you know that thinking of saying we can just have one chiplet to chiplet interface, I think was a little short sighted because we don't have one package type. We have multiple packaging types, and we're probably going to get a few more. You know, starting to see things being embedded in packages and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think that's the challenge of having just one chiplet to chiplet interface is we don't have one packaging type. And maybe we'll get there. Maybe everyone doing these chiplet will standardize on, you know, someone next year will come out with Gen X super package and it'll meet, meet the needs of cost and and performance and all the things that people need and, and then we'll be able then you know if we narrow the scope of packaging it becomes then these flows become a lot simpler because we can build them for a specific packaging type but that's that's not reality day i think people i've seen companies you know building the same device in you know one in silicon one in rdl and you know we'll see which which one works the best for them the RDL is going to be cheaper, so if it gets the same performance, then they, they would they go with that approach. So uh, this is a good discussion, but stay on that slide if you don't mind. This it's a good discussion, and, and you're covering you're covering the the shrinkage so from left to right is what you've just been going through in some detail, which is which is good to hear. Um, but for me, I'm a systems guy, and when you cover, everything's all about sucking everything into the damn package. But we still have to build systems. You know, the Frontier supercomputer is a massive system <laughs> that needs to be connected yeah, efficiently. Yeah. Um, so it looks yeah. like, so, so we're going from this sub half a picojoule per bit, you know, a half a picojoule per bit is too high, and we're getting smaller and smaller and right. smaller with all these wonderful yep. internets you're doing. But at the other end, we come out of a ball, and we still got 30 dBs at 10 picojoules per bit. So it's like a it's like yeah. a jump of 20x. What are we doing at yeah. the system level to sort of make a bit more of a graceful increase? Now I see you've got everyone saying, oh, silicon photonics, co-packaged optics, that's gonna solve all the problems. Sorry, that's a decade or more away before we really get that established everywhere. So we need something in the interim between the less than half a picojoule per bit and the 10 picojoule per bit. We CXL is going to fail if it sticks at 10 picojoules per bit. <laughs> yeah. When you look at the cost of the power, because the power is far greater to get to the memory um, uh, with CXL over PCI channels than it is to a local DDR channel. But local DDR is far too far too slow, and HBM is far too small. So we we we, we need to solve this problem in a more beyond just focusing inside the package. So what does Cadence think of that? Well, I, I so it's a great point. So I, you know, I was going to say, you know, that that's the future is this, uh, you know, basically optics, but or photonics. Uh, but that, you know, this has always been, that's why we have system on a chip, right? Is we took, we're trying to get as much as we can crammed into a hunk of silicon where we can get them, that, you know, that's the ideal scenario. It's one hunk of silicon, you're going to get the best performance lowest power all those types of things out of that but we're, you're right we built we don't we, we're building these huge systems and there's always been a huge cost of moving off the die and on right. to the 
PCB at the at the packaging interface. And the big cost was these huge I/O buffers that we had to put in, right? Because they had this big signal capacitive load that they had to drive through. Then that took up tons of space on, on the chips. Uh, and we moved to area array and things like that. But that, that you know, came to the tool provider. So we're we will we we're not necessarily out there developing that some breakthrough technology that's up to the, the people on the call that design products we design tools and, and and flows and to some degree ip in this space but we're not out inventing new materials and, and things like that that's kind of outside the scope of what we do well i, I guess if you, if you like what, what what we're doing here is we're seeing that we're basically sucking the server into a package you know because heterogeneously if you look at everything we're doing we're, we're putting accelerators next to cpus and we we sucked in the the memory so if you look at it it looks like a server inside a package um okay um yeah so 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 that's good and you call it disaggregated and sure enough it is disaggregated but um the other level of disaggregation that still happens and will have to happen is 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 all of these inside a inside a disaggregated rack, separated memory? We always say Excel memory or storage, or or separate separate nodes of accelerators that can be composed by software um, for a specific domain problem. Now the problem is with those at that end, it's it's north of 20 picojoules per bit, and as you said, it's the moving of the data that burns all the power. And so we have a local minima focus. Uh, the silicon companies have a local minima focus of reducing power because you actually have to because the bandwidths are going so high. Um, uh, and, and so this is great what we're all doing, but we're doing it just inside the package. We are not thinking at the system level. Now. And, and, and so, so it, it, what, what my recommendation is, are you familiar with the OAM module? Are you, you, are you familiar with that, or, or NVIDIA's SXM modules, where they put their? their Alan, let me let me suggest that we hold this till the last ten minutes, so that John okay, can. Yeah, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. I, I apologize. No, my, my, my bad. John, it was my detour that triggered all this. I apologize. Uh, if you, you, yeah, if you can get back to your regular pro programming. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, we might have some time at the end. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so back to the slide here. Very good conversation, very good question. But um, and I'm and I'm almost through here. So um, the, so that on the chip side, we talked about you know the need to have the, all the detailed information. On the packaging side, we you know the challenge that our our package designers are facing is really that transition from laminate to silicon design or something that's going to be done in a foundry. And really, what that means is they they've had in the past had a very informal process of running DFM. And that way they were good to go and some board house or substrate provider built it and then they'll set, uh, did the assembly and test. Now when they're building something on silicon, now we, they, you know, a very big change happens. They now need a formal sign off of the DRC and LDF and to some degree the, the metal balancing or metal fill. That way we route power, handle power structures um, is different in silicon in many cases than how we handle it. On laminate, on laminate, we put a big copper pour down um, that you know, basically you can call them copper planes, our power planes that that, that distribute the, the power and ground structures. When you move to silicon, you can't have huge hunks of metal like that; it can't be built, won't yield. So there's different styles of routing that come to play to handle the the the, the ability to actually manufacture the design. So you, you see this combination now in the layout tools. So okay, at this level of packaging. I need this sort of of metal structures to build my my power my power and ground uh, domains, and in this other level, I need this other type. So there it turns out to be a very you know, can be a complex issue um, if you don't have the right implementation tools to to handle that. Uh, and then of course, last but not you know, we always go back to design capacity. We're cramming more and more uh, with you know, smaller and smaller pin pitches into the you know, same size box. So we're we're at the design capacity is is growing exponentially, and especially when you see something like a, a uh, an ultra high density RDL with a highly degassed uh, power and ground structure, where you might have two million instances that represent represent the degassing holes in that structure. So, um, 
another big challenge for uh, the package design community is coming up with having tools that can handle these, uh, or they can't handle it doing a lot more in batch, just like we do in the IC design domain. So that's kind of a, a, a few of the challenges, obviously not all the challenges. There's a lot more challenges that are out there. This is meant just kind of to, to get the discussion started um, and to kind of, kind of wrap up what to look for, what we think is important for kind of the next generation of 3D AHI platforms is, uh, again, a top-level aggregation environment that basically allows you to do something like this picture. So I can uh, grab the, you know, start to figure out the BGA that the interposer is going to sit on, start to integrate my analog and RF and my different chiplets and, you know, the die, the, the ASIC I'm designing as part of this, even the PCB starting to come up and, and figure out from a thermal perspective, from a signal integrity perspective, from a connectivity perspective, how all of this is best arranged. Uh, and even if it's 2.5D, there's still a stack here, right? You have a ASIC on an interposer on a package that three tiers of packaging or three levels of stacking. So this environment obviously needs to be, um, support that concept and, and be able to work uh, in the third dimension. And this is, Cadence has some technology here. I don't. Hopefully, some people are familiar with uh, the TSMC's 3D blocks that they announced at OIP about a month ago. Um, and that's what 3D blocks. One of the things it does is come up with all this configuration for how things need to be oriented in the different tiers of packaging and how it connects together. Uh, I mentioned the importance of early stage uh, analysis for our customers that are moving to to full stack. That thermal becomes the absolute most important thing that they need to do early in the design process. Because like I said, you can't wait until the place and route of everything's been done to find out thermally that it's not gonna work. You need to, to make some adjustments and calculations based on experience and, and per, parametric data uh, that you can enter here. We couple together power and thermal because you can't really separate them. Uh, and so you can do, we have a, a language that allows you to, to describe early stage power rail structures uh, in this real simple language that can be that done here, used to calculate the power, which couples with the thermal. If once you come up with the right, uh, basically the, you find the solution space answer that you're looking for, that same language can be brought into our place and route tool to regenerate the, the power structure you use to uh, describe up here. Uh, this In this area, it's, it's, it's there's a lot of param uh, parameterized data you can add, or if you want to add a heat sink, um, I mentioned you, you, you definitely want to add the PCB because it, it comes for free and it's a big uh, uh, free mechanism for distributing heat. So you can say, oh, it's going to be on a 10 by 10 board, for example, in here, and, and use all that together to come up with some early stage uh, uh, results that help drive the, the not only the 3D placement, but the 2D placement of the design. What's really becoming important now and significant is pre-route signal integrity. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a customer that found this very valuable. And they were doing a, a design that had a lot of chiplets in it. They were doing a 2.5D or so a silicon interposer that was sitting on a laminate. And their their foundry could only build a at this time a, a silicon interposer that was 1.5X reticle in it. So they couldn't fit all their chiplets side by side on that interposer and they knew they had to put some of the chiplets down on the laminate. And so what, what's very important in that case is to look at, again, the compliance of that chiplet to chiplet interface. Now it's not just going through one level of package, not just going through an interposer. It now goes through that interposer through a TSV to the backside of that interposer onto a laminate and connect there. And again, you don't want to do all the details of place and route of that to find out it's not going to work. And so it's important to have these, these tools that allow you to drop down parameterized models or you can sweep across length or impedance and uh, put in you know, different driver receiver models, uh, put in parameterized slice subcircuits for TFDs, whatever it might happen to be, and run that signal integrity early stage before place and route to determine which chiplets are best suited to be moved further away and off the interposer and onto the laminate. So that becomes an important part of this early stage planning. And then, again, a lot of people forget about this until it's very late, but you have to be able to do system LBS. You have to be able to 
formally sign off that everything's aligned through your, your packaging configuration and everything is co corrected uh, correctly from a logical point of view. And there's no better environment than this environment where you're capturing that top level uh, optimized net list through this to drive through it. And then, of course, I, I, we talked about the nuances and the different types of packaging that are out there. So it's important that you have this, this integration aggregation platform that can drive into the appropriate implementation tool. If it's a silicon stack, you probably need to go into a digital place and route tool that can support multiple left devs or multiple PDKs. If you're, you know, all these things still sit on laminates today before they go onto the PCB in most 99% of the cases. So you need to have the laminate uh, support of a laminate uh, package implementation tool uh, that these tools can feed into. And then, of course, uh, to design all the, the so package optics or any RF or mimic or any, any of those types of devices, you need to be able to drive into that. And then, of course, at the back end here, have the appropriate um, electrical and thermal sign-off tools. Because even though you do all the signal integrity and thermal and power analysis up here, you still, you know, that's a lot of based on the user's experience you still need to sign off that on the back end and so this is that's the approach Katie's taking is really creating a integrated flow uh, that makes it easier to transition from this top level pathfinding stage through the different implementation stages and into the final sign off and that i believe yeah so just in summary um you know Packaging, this world we call more than more, it's really packaging and, and, and really new innovative ways of, of doing uh, packaging. And they're all across the board. They will continue, that will continue to grow. We're going to see new packaging technologies come out, you know, on a regular basis. Not going to be once every two years. There's going to be, you know, three or four potential new packages coming out every year, potentially, or at least variances of those different packages. Um, there's lots of challenges. We're working through a lot of those, uh, you know, of the, the challenges that we're, I'd say half, some, half those things have been somewhat solved, but there's still challenges um, that are, are facing people moving to the, this world of 3DHI, and I believe that wraps up. Thank you for your time. I got a couple minutes. We're barely down to a minute. So, um, hey, well, before I... Alan, the floor is yours if you want to pursue your question. Uh, yes, but this is our last meeting for this year. So uh, we meet again in the new year. Happy holidays and happy new year to everyone. Just a, a simple question. What, what, are, what are the largest uh, or, organic laminates uh, you're seeing now in terms of package sizes? Uh, largest organic substrate? Are you talking a PCB or just like a BGA, LGA? Well, like a, I'm trying to wonder if if the world can merge because I see packages up to like maybe almost a hundred by a hundred, and modules like uh, SXM and OAM are are coming down to like like a hundred by a hundred and fifty, and so when you merge the two and they have high speed connectors on, so I'm wondering, can we get rid of traditional packages with solder balls, and put these these um these multi chip um, these uh, these new chiplet systems actually down onto uh, a, a larger board that traditionally is seen as a PCB but could be seen as a substrate with high speed connectors so you have great signal integrity and no solder balls that are horrible signal integrity. Sure, we absolutely could. And I, I don't think many for high performance devices people don't use solder balls anymore. They use their land grid arrays. So you don't have that to shoot solder anyway. So that that's not a factor. But your you know, so yeah, everything everything at the system level is it, it costs a lot less money because it's not manufacturing as precisely as we do in a foundry. And right. so I, I don't I don't think that goes. You know there have been I've, you know I I'd say ten years ago there was I forget who it was was promoting a the PCBs built out of silicon that basically you. Take a wafer, and that's your PCB, and everything goes on that, and that's your end, end product. So uh, that, there's there's problems with that as well. So I, um, you know, it's and every system different, right? Different. You're, you're building a, you're, what you're building something that's a, you know a heart a pacemaker. That's different than a rack, you know, a server farm rack. There, there's just other, we have all these different types of products. 
you know, right. the, you know that go into the automobiles, that go into server farms, that go into your body, that go, you know, all over the place. So right. I, I don't think there'll ever be a one size fits all for for everything. Right. Thanks. Okay. We're okay. losing people rapidly. Any other questions from anyone? John, thank you so much. This was incredibly engaging. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I, I'm glad you agreed to come and present with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invite. All right, everyone, take care then. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays.